And joining us now, Dan Bortolotti. He is the author of Wild Blue, A Natural History of the World's Largest Animal. Hi, Dan. Nice to meet you. Thank you. You know, we're going to have a little fun off the top here just because this is an animal that I suspect, you know, 1% of our viewers may have seen, maybe not even 1%. Mm -hmm. So to give people a sense of how big these things really are, Michael, if you would, let's bring this up. Here is a graphic which suggests the size of a blue whale, the length of three school buses. And if we flip that over to the next one, how about in terms of weight? A blue whale at 181 metric tons is the same as 40 elephants. Now, you've got a measurement in your book as well. How do you like to make the comparison? Yeah, the way I like to try to describe it so people can understand is I say, if you imagine, well, they recognize that there are 30 teams in the National Hockey League. There are 30 teams in Major League Baseball. That's what works out to a total of about 1,440 players. At about 200 pounds each, all of those players weigh about the same as a large female blue whale. <laughs> They're big. <laughs> yes. They are big. Do you know as much, I mean, you've studied them for a long time now. Do you know as much about them as you think you need to know? Well, I mean, the reason that I wrote the book, you know, in the first place was that I was struck by just how little we know about an animal that's so big. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would, you would think that the world's largest animal would be very conspicuous and would be easy to study. I mean, when you think of what scientists know about honeybees and about, uh, you know, chimpanzees and other animals that we can study closely, you would think that the blue whale would be a relatively easy animal to study. But the fact is, because they spend most of their lives underwater, uh, they can live hundreds or thousands of miles offshore for many months of the year. And the fact that until very recently there just weren't very many blue whales around to study, we actually know remarkably little about these animals, including some very basic things. So like, how much time in their life would they spend in a place where we actually could see them? Well, they're typically only observed in the summer months because that's when they come into uh, areas close to shore. And um, in, there are really only about four or five places in the world where we can observe them for a few months a year in the summertime. Uh, one of those being the St. Lawrence in, in Quebec and uh, Southern California is one of the other major areas. But um, for up to six months a year, we have no idea where they go. And of course, they were nearly extinct a while ago. They were. And uh, about it's only been in the last 20, 25 years that we have really had uh, long-term studies on blue whales in various parts of the world. Before that, in the 60s and 70s, they were virtually unknown and believed to be on the verge of extinction. Let me follow up on that, and I'll read an excerpt of your book to get us started onto our next path here. No human industry followed a more reckless, myopic pattern than whaling, you tell us. From the beginning, whalers concentrated on one species, hunted it intensively until there were so few that it was uneconomical to continue, and then moved on to a different species or another part of the ocean and did the same. Until the late 19th century, blue whales avoided being the next species crossed off the list because they were too fast and too heavy to haul in, and they lived too far out to sea for shore-based whalers to pursue them. But the Everest of whales remained the ultimate goal, and once technology allowed humans to overcome their handicaps, they made up for lost time. Hunting a species to near extinction in the era of open boats and hand harpoons could take hundreds of years, but modern whalers almost succeeded in emptying the oceans of blue whales in a few bloody decades. Okay, a bunch of things to unpack here. Mm -hmm. Why was whaling so rampant for such a period of time? Well, I mean, whaling started centuries ago because the raw material of whales, namely the blubber, which was used to make oil, and its meat, which was uh, very popular with European Catholics in, in uh, the Renaissance and later on because, uh, because of the ban on eating meat on Fridays and Holy Days, mm -hmm. whale meat didn't count, and so it was a very popular uh, uh, product. Um, later in the 20th century, um, it became, uh, they became raw material for uh, items such as soap and margarine, and that's in fact why the blue whale was hunted so vigorously in the early part of the 20th century. It was made mostly into soap and uh, margarine, which was an important fat source uh, before the war. And um, I mean, the, the, the problem is that it's very difficult to uh, pursue and hunt whales, and so when you, are, when you find an area where it's economical to do so, it makes some economic sense to simply exploit it until they're all gone. And in fact, uh, I think you give the example of a thousand whales in a particular part of the world, 999 would have been killed? Well, that was the case with blue whales in the Antarctic. I mean, the, the pre-whaling population was probably in the order of 240, 250,000 blue whales. Um, over the course of 60 years that Antarctic whaling was going on, uh, about 330,000 blue whales were killed. 
uh, which worked. And by the mid-1960s, when the last census was done, uh, uh, or at the end of the whaling era, there may have been a few hundred left. A few moment. hundred in the whole yeah. world left? Well, in, in the Antarctic. In the Antarctic. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have really reliable estimates for other parts of the world. But in the Antarctic, which the Antarctic population was so much larger than all of the other populations combined, that was really you know, the, the mother load for whalers. And yeah, they eliminated probably 99.9% .9 of them. Hmm. How did two world wars affect whaling? Well, uh, the First World War was very interesting because uh, whaling did continue during the First World War. Uh, the ships, the fleets were able to get to the Antarctic safely. Uh, and one of the things that I found really fascinating when, when doing the research for this book was that uh, one of the byproducts of whale fat is glycerin. And glycerin is the inactive ingredient in soap, which is why uh, that was an important raw material. But it can also be used to make nitroglycerin, an explosive. And so there's some evidence that some of the shells and explosives that were used to kill soldiers in the First World War would have come from whales. Hmm. And uh, in the Second World War, it was a little bit different because uh, it was so difficult to get those large convoys to the Antarctic without being torpedoed by U-boats as they were in the Atlantic. <laughs> and in fact, in a few cases, uh, the uh, factory whaling vessels were torpedoed by the Germans. Um, so whaling all but ceased in, in the war years from about 1940 to 44, there was very little whaling going on in the Antarctic. But Which may have given the population a chance to come back a bit? Well, you would hope so. And, and certainly uh, around in 1945 when the war ended, people thought, well, you know, this four years probably gave the whales a respite. Unfortunately, it didn't appear to be the case. I mean, four years just simply wasn't enough for a significant recovery. And even if it was, the whaling resumed in the mid-1940s and continued through the 1950s, you know, with such enthusiasm that whatever recovery there was would have been quickly uh, erased. But that changed, and somehow the world came together and the species did not go extinct. That's what right. happened? Well, that, that's a really interesting part of the story, and I have to say that uh, because by, even by the mid-1960s, and I think if you look back at, if you date the you know, uh, birth of the environmental movement in the West to, to Rachel Carson and Silent Spring in the 1960s, which was the first book to really kind of raise consciousness about the environment among the general public, I think by the mid-1960s, people didn't really think too much about whales and didn't really care about their plight very much. And certainly when Greenpeace came along in the early 1970s, I mean, blue whale hunting had already ended for, for several years. There were hardly any blue whales left anyway. Um, but around the early 1970s, there seemed to be a very dramatic shift in our attitudes towards blue whales. What, and What would account for that? Well, I think a big part of it had to do with... Um, the songs of the humpback whale, actually, which were just starting to be recorded at that time. And I think people listened to those songs in the 60s and the early 70s. I mean, the first recording of, of humpback whale songs became a best-selling album. And I think that, you know, it's a very surprising thing, but people were really captivated by this idea of large mammals singing these beautiful songs, how intelligent they must be. And because they knew that blue whales were on the verge of extinction, they had this image of, of loneliness in the ocean, this idea that there were these gigantic, majestic creatures roaming the lonely ocean, calling out to others of their kind, and there was no one else you know, out there to hear them. It's unusual, and I, though, wouldn't you say? I mean, given that these aren't cute and cuddly pandas, which the world came together to try to save. These yeah, are big, that, big animals no one ever sees. Absolutely. That's why I think it's very unusual that the blue whale became a, such an icon of conservation, because, as you said, I mean, people can identify with seal pups that they see slaughtered on the ice. They can, they can identify with pandas that they see in a zoo. Nobody saw any blue whales in the 1970s. Even, even marine biologists, most of them had never seen a blue whale. But I think the other part of that is it also worked to their advantage. Because they were so, uh, there was such a lack of understanding, people um, gave them all kinds of qualities that, that they liked in them. So in other words, we decided, well, blue whales must be incredibly intelligent. They must be very compassionate. They must have this emotional repertoire. And of course, there's no scientific basis for any of that. I mean, the intelligence, I think, that that there is some. But at the time, certainly no one had ever studied blue whale intelligence. And so all of these things, we kind of, you know, uh, we anthropomorphized the animals a little bit, I sure. think, and, and, and gave them qualities we wish that they had. Do they still face threats today? They do, certainly. Uh, um, thank God there's no more hunting of blue whales and hasn't been for over 40 years. Um, but as we saw uh, two summers ago off California when uh, three and perhaps four blue whales were struck by large ships and killed and were found floating in the sea, they face a lot of threats from shipping. 
and uh, in areas like the St. Lawrence here in Canada where they're also very popular, it's also a very busy shipping lane. And it's very difficult for us to know what the extent uh, of the damage is because very often I think these whales are probably struck, killed, and they sink to the bottom before anybody knows. In this case, uh, they were wounded and they seemed to, uh, they were bloated and they floated to the surface. But uh, I think in areas like Southern California and the St. Lawrence where there are busy shipping lanes, there are probably blue whales killed every year and may continue to be in. And they could significantly threaten the population in those areas. Here's an odd area of consideration, noise pollution. Is that a problem for them? Yes, it is. And uh, blue whales are, are very sensitive to low frequency sounds. That seems to be how they communicate with one another. And uh, throughout the ocean, there are a lot of uh, military and commercial ships that are emitting very loud sounds, uh, whether they're looking for enemy submarines or whether they're exploring for oil and gas in the sea. And one can imagine how difficult it would be for an animal to communicate. These are animals that are believed to communicate across at least dozens if not hundreds of kilometers or more. And in a noisy ocean, the, the obstacles that they face in communicating with each other over distance are very large. And the noisier the oceans are, the harder they're going to find it to get together and communicate, which may affect their ability to mate, and it may affect their ability to reproduce. And just finally, do you have a sense about what the state of the blue whale population would be in the world today, given that it's hard to measure, obviously. Mm -hmm. It is hard to measure, the, but the best estimate is probably in the order of 10,000 animals worldwide, which um, doesn't sound like a lot and really isn't a lot when you compare them to its historical numbers. But most of the populations that are known and that are well studied now seem to be at least stable and in some cases increasing. So it's mostly a good news story. How many times have you seen Star Trek IV The Voyage Home? <laughs> I have only seen it once. <laughs> only once? <laughs> but, uh... That's the best movie about whales. Come on. <laughs> Look at everybody here in the studio. They know what I'm talking about. Well, you know what? I'm a huge Star Trek fan, but I'm much more a fan of the new Star Trek, I have to say, not rather than the movies. You're too young. That's the problem. You're too <laughs> Must young. Be. Dan, it's good of you to visit us in TVO tonight. Thanks so much. We Thank appreciate you. your time.